Welcome along to Shine Today and joining me tonight, the wonderful Sue Van Schraven from Orphans Aid International. So welcome. Hi there, wonderful to be here. Thank you for inviting me. It is amazing, this technology, which means we get to talk to each other from uh, different parts of the world. It's pretty awesome, isn't it? It really, really is. Thank you very much. Uh, well, firstly, I want to ask this question. For those who don't know the work of Orphans Aid, what exactly do you guys do? Okay, so we're a charitable trust started in Invercargill here in New Zealand and we help children around the globe. So children who don't have parents, children who are abandoned, children who are in extreme situations. We do help Kiwi kids as well, but predominantly children that are really suffering and have nobody to take care of them. So there's a massive job, massive task we've oh, been given. Yeah, I can imagine. So uh, tell us the story about how... Orphans Aid International came to be. How did the whole idea materialise? Well, um, it's certainly not something that you just wake up one day and think, gosh, I'm going to do, um, you know, start a charity or start caring for children around the world. Um, so it goes a long, long way back to when I was a child. I had a desire to um, make sure that children had parents. So something deep within me, um, I, I suppose you could call it, I suppose you could say it felt like a God-given um, task or a God-given call. And um, so, gosh, I actually wrote a book because so many people are asking me, how did you get started? I never knew whether to give the short version or the long version. Yeah, <laughs> I understand. The short version. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, it's a, I, I believe it's a God-given desire to want to care for kids that don't have parents. So, um as the years have gone by, that that call, I suppose you could say, has just deepened and strengthened. And uh, then when I was in my 20s, it really felt like, OK, um, it's time to take this desire a step further. Mm. So let's talk about that desire and talk about yeah. the objectives of, of Orphans Aid. I mean, what do you guys do? What are some of those key ones for you? OK, so... Um, it, probably the biggest thing is giving children a family uh, or giving them a home, giving them shelter. So um, making sure that kids have a mum and dad, that nobody's by themselves. Our, uh, one of our sayings is um, we believe all children should thrive. So it's making sure that um, children aren't suffering. And um, it started with a home for children in Romania. I'd always had a desire to travel or to visit um, Eastern Europe or Russia and Romania were the two places that I really wanted when I was much younger to get involved. And the doors opportunity opened to go into Romania. And at that time, uh, there was a lot of abandoned children living in very rundown um, hospital cots, I suppose you could say, 24-7. Mm -hmm. And the opportunity came to be able to go and um, see those children and it was at that point okay are we going to um just leave them there and think okay that's so, such a sad story or are we actually going to do something about it so um we had to make a decision you know it's all or nothing you're going to put everything into helping these kids who have been abandoned or you're going to um turn turn your blind eye and walk away mm. so uh, let's talk about the problem and the scale of it i mean how big is this, this, this problem of orphans, abandoned children mm -hmm. around the world? Mm, well, it's, and sadly, it's not a problem that's going away, and it is huge. I've seen a lot of data on it where different figures are pulled, in it and, and depending on whether they calculate an orphan as having a parent somewhere or whether it's truly an orphan. But we, we used to have T-shirts that were 150 million orphans need our help. And 150 million orphans has kind of been one of those standard figures um, that major organisations have pulled out for a long time. So the figures, the number's almost too big to get your head around. Mm. So the thing is to look at what the needs are that are in front of you and to begin where you can. So for us, it was with four children in uh, Romania, and, and we're now caring for um, around 2,000 children a day around the wow. globe. So that's really grown hugely. But we can get a little bit stumped by numbers and it's it, um, 
you know, I think that can be a problem for people when it comes to international aid, that it's, oh, gosh, you know, it's all just a bit too big, a bit too much, so we won't do anything because how do we know we're doing anything? But you've got to get that thinking out of your mind. You've really got to think, okay, here's, here's an opportunity. There's some children we can help. Let's let's begin, and then you you build on it bit by bit. So, yeah, and sometimes I've thought, you know, if if we suddenly were able to achieve everything we wanted to achieve, uh, what would we do if we weren't mm-hmm. caring for orphan children? But the reality is, there's always going to be needs with children. We've got, you know, there's always going to be a war breaking out, or a famine breaking out, or some injustice that is done somewhere to a child. So. The need is always going to be there in our world, sadly, um, mm. you know, whether it's poverty um, driven or sickness driven or, you know, as I say, victims of war. So the numbers are huge, but we can't get drowned by them. And we, we just have to look at what it is that we can do or what it is that we believe God is asking us to do. Mm. And it might be here in New Zealand, it might be your next door neighbour, might be foster children, it might be a nation or nations. Um, and knowing what it is that we're meant to do or what we're meant to respond to. Mm. I'm sure over the years, you know, things have changed in, in the way that you operate, but I'm, I'm thinking back to those early days when you first started out. What did that feel like for you? Mm. Well, when we first started, I had two small children of my own, but we still do, <laughs> well, they're not small anymore. Um, and you'd sort of look at your own kids and you think, now, if that was my child that was stuck in a hospital cot somewhere in the corner of a, um, in the corner of a, you know, forgotten hospital, what would I do to help my child? And so I was, I was very driven by um, wanting to make sure children were cared for. Um, and so it seemed a natural step to I've got my two kids, so what am I doing about these other kids? Um, and probably really, really in my heart believed this was what we were meant to be doing and this is what God was asking us to do. So I probably thought that it was going to be a little easier than it has been. I probably thought that others would respond maybe to the need quicker than mm. they have. Mm. Um, but... Um, yeah, it was also very exciting. It was also very exciting because we were, um, we'd started and we were seeing kids put in a home and um, we were seeing kids taken out of terrible situations and seeing them grow healthy. Then as we began to move on to other countries, that was really cool as well because there was different people that got on board. So some people had a real heart for Asia or India and, you know, they came on board and, and helped in those areas or or, or Uganda. And so um, each step we've taken has been another excite, exciting step along the way. Some people have said, well, why don't you just stop in one place and um, concentrate on that particular area? But there's needs all around the world and there's different people who will partner or who will have a heart for a particular part of the world or a, or a culture or an understanding so I just don't think we need to limit God and 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 who we reach out to. If if the, if He places them in front of us, uh, then we need to have the faith, I suppose, to to break that bread and to see it multiply and and to keep on growing. So yeah, it was exciting. There was a buzz, but it was also scary. Um, it was also scary of we suddenly had some big bills and and mm. no way to pay for them, you know. Um, and it was scary of oh dear, you know, what's a a couple of months down the track, um, we can't keep the home running or we can't send the money that we need. Um, But, you know, God has always been faithful and um, sometimes it's been very last minute, but uh, it has been one miracle after another. And it's still like that, even though we've been going now 18 years, um, definitely the faith has grown in those 18 years because God has never let us down, even though it has been very testing at times. But um, the needs are still huge. In fact, probably now it's we probably believe for more. So, um, you know, I remember in the early days thinking, gosh, we're needing, you know, a couple of thousand. One day we'll be believing for 20,000 or whatever it might be. And But really now we're believing for larger amounts because so your faith grows with it because you can see actually we really can bring change to these lives so um 
in a lot of ways it hasn't changed to be honest because you reach for more mm. and, and and you grow with it and um, it's still very exciting to see lives getting changed and hope coming um, hope coming to situations so maybe the workloads changed a lot and a lot more people know who we are now so that's really awesome uh, at the beginning, nobody knew who Orphan's Aid was. So if you were doing a sausage sizzle down at the warehouse, who cared, you know? <laughs> but it has changed and the world's become a lot more complex as well. So you've alluded to the fact that, gosh, things have really grown for Orphan, Orphan's Aid over the last number of years, many years, in fact. And so much, there's been so much faith and trust in God throughout that time. But honestly, the last two years have been pretty tough, I think, for everyone. How's it affected you guys and how you operate? Mm. Well, um, we've done a lot of travelling in um, 2018 and 2019. So coming into 2020, um, there, there didn't seem the need to, to jump in a plane um, that year, which was actually very, very good. But, of course, um, all our project areas, all the places where we work around the globe with children, they were all going through something basically the same as what we were going through here in New Zealand, where they were either shut down in their um, project areas or shut down in their homes. Um, and so it, it it was a real challenge for all of the um, areas where we care for children. They were either, um, none of the kids were going to school um, in any of the countries we were involved with, and getting food to various places was also a real challenge. So, um, but the great thing is that in all the areas that we work, we've got long-term partners who we've really built trust and reputation with. So they all um, were able to be there for the kids and they were finding resourceful ways to get food into particular areas, particularly very, very poor areas like the likes of India where um, you know everything comes to a grinding halt. So maybe the food that the hotels were throwing out the back door for the beggars was no longer there. Or in Uganda where maybe the people would come to a market but the market wasn't operating anymore so our partners were very resourceful and um, very creative in making sure that the food supplies especially were getting out to the neediest of the needy um, so yeah it, it was a challenging time but we uh, we got through that and we've all come out the other side uh, and probably all come out the other side stronger, to be honest. Mm. Um, and we've all learnt different ways of communicating, like the Zoom call, for instance. Um, in a couple of weeks' time, I'm heading back overseas, and it'll be the first time since we had those um, initial lockdowns that I've been able to get back to the project areas. And that, that's a real biggie for me, because in the past, I would be travelling every six months or so. Um, my husband was in Romania and Ukraine in June, and so that was really good to to be able to have um, to be able to go back to those places. And we have also a wonderful worker in um, in Uganda who was able to come back um, uh, earlier this year as well. And just to be able to for him to reconnect back here in New Zealand with family and friends, and for us to see that he was doing well um, as well so yeah it has been challenging but um, I believe we are on on the other side of those restrictions anyway and um, we just got to keep persevering don't we you know yeah. when you, you believe you're doing the right thing then um, I suppose it's a bit like the the Red Sea it's got to part somehow doesn't it <laughs> <laughs> if it doesn't part one way, yeah. it'll part the other way. So if God's really asking us to take care of these kids, which we believe he is, uh, then um, we just have to trust that he'll find the solutions along the way. Mm. But, yeah, it has, been, it has been challenging for sure. Gosh, I, I can only think that over the 18 years that you've been operating that you've got some incredible stories to tell. Uh, but I wonder if you could tell us briefly three of your most memorable ones. Can you oh, can well, you pick okay. three? I mean, that's yeah, going to be yeah, pretty yeah. hard, it right? It is a challenge, actually, <laughs> because, um, yeah, though, and, and different stories for um, uh, in different countries as well. Um, but probably the ones that stand out the most to me uh, may be the ones that have grabbed my heart the most. Um, if you've seen any of our documentaries, which Shine has been playing over the years, which has been just wonderful, um, you would have seen me with a um, a young boy called Andre. 
And Andre was the one of the first four children that we met at Kasakiwi when we were setting up the home in Romania. And he was three years old. He couldn't walk, talk, eat. He'd actually had a really bad childhood. Mm. Um, and so Andre was one of the of the first four that came into our home and uh, he's we've got video footage of him learning to walk you know that's um how neglected he had been um and so we really grew to to love andre like our like a son and same age as my youngest son so he felt like a son um when he was about 10 or 11 he got cancer mm -hmm. and we thought we were going to lose andre and he got through that challenge um, and it, school was always a challenge for him because he had had such a bad start, but he had some wonderful school teachers around him. Mm. But the neat thing with Andre is he's he graduated from school. He's in his music band. He's very musical. Uh, he's left Kasakiwi now and he's in his own flat. He's got his independence and he's working. He's self-sufficient. He's still being looked after. You know, the home is still keeping an eye on him. But he's come from being this child that really had everything um, going against him to now being a young adult living independently and just a really great guy who just encourages um, others around him. And he's a real role model for the younger mm -hmm. kids that are coming into the home because the home that he was in, um, a lot of the children get adopted out. We've had 85 adoptions from that home now, but some of them haven't been adopted and Andre was one of those ones. So the older ones grow up through the home and and there's this changing of kids so he's become like a real role model so um he's such such a big part of my heart I look forward to seeing him um in just a few short weeks um and then there's been others like there was another young boy Mongol who I met on my first trip to India and what took me with Mongol was he was a very sad boy very sad mm -hmm. expression on his face and his father had just passed away so normally you know if you're on the streets um in Asia or India or wherever, you know, if you pick up your cell phone and you start taking some um, selfies with kids, you'll get a smile, but couldn't get any expression from from Mongol. Um, and then the next time I was in India, his mother had just passed away. She passed away from, they, they lived on the streets, they're basically a dirty footpath with rubbish piles and, you know, feces and rats and just a really not very nice area at all. Um, his mother had just passed away, so his face was still just so um, sad. His mother passed away basically from just a simple infection, um, mm. simple, you know, something that we would go to the doctors and get antibiotics for. Um, so I couldn't get a smile from from Mongol either. And uh, then we helped with um, some wonderful donors, gave some money that we were able to get a ritual for his older brother so that they could make a little bit of money delivering goods. Um, and he grew up on the streets. So every time I went to India, I would see him and I would see um, his older brother who had the rickshaw and some of the kids around him. Um, and then he had a childhood sweetheart that he'd met on the street, another girl who was growing up on the street. And when they, I don't know, they were later in their teenage years, they wanted to get married. Um, but um, Mongol was from a Hindu background and, and Mahima was from a Muslim background. So it was this really clash um, in Indian culture. Um, and some of the local people wanted to kill Mahima, his fiance. So um, they were chasing them, looking, trying to find them to basically kill um, the, because they wanted to get married. And um, anyway, they were, one of our team members had them in another town and they were went to live in a house. First time they'd ever moved off the streets, they lived in a house. Um, anyway, last time I was in India, I saw them, I caught up with them and uh, they were married and they had two children and a third one on the way. And um, for a kid, it's kind of like a slum, slum dog millionaire sort of story. Mm -hmm. um, he's not a millionaire, but he might as well be. He, um, he's got his beautiful wife and his kids. He, he's got support around him. He's earning a living. He, he loves the Lord. He's learnt what it is to, you know, care for others and himself. And he's really had this massive just 
turnaround in his life. So I can't wait to see him again too. I'm not sure when I can get back to India, but um, I know I'll well out with tears when I see him because mm. uh, it's just uh, such a good outcome. So it's, it's when you can see these results, you know, it's so encouraging. Uh, and probably another one that really stands out to me was um, not one that I knew um personally, but just was something I was so excited to hear. And it was a, a couple and um, a lady in Uganda who was um, pregnant to have a child. And the, t- the team knew that she was um, about to have a child and, and they suddenly it went very quiet. So they were concerned about what had happened. So they went to visit her in her very poor village area. And they found the mother and she was obviously no longer pregnant anymore and inquired where the baby was. Um, And the baby had been born with some deformities, but she didn't know she could get help. She didn't know what to do. So she had basically put the baby in a back room to die Mm. and uh, thought that's all she could do. So the team turned up um, and knocked on the door and were just asking how she was. And they said, oh, do you mind if we see the baby? And so they, they, she took them into the room where she basically left it to die and they could see that the baby did have some issues. They explained that we could get the baby to the hospital and we could actually, um, the baby could be treated. So that's what the team did. They contacted another charity that was working at a hospital and was able to take this woman and her child in and the child had surgery and was reunited with the mother, you know, and the team have been able to get her alongside. So it's really uh, um, back from the dead, really, you know, and, and how wonderful for that child and how wonderful for for that mother. So these are just good news stories that just, you know, I could go on. There was another one of um, these kids who were t- uh, bought from our team in India. They, they um, basically, someone came out, well, they didn't buy them from our team, but they, they they were known on the streets um, to our team, known very well. Some people came along and paid some money to somebody else to take these kids away. Um, but one of our teams saw um, the exchange of hands and alerted another person in the team and the police were alerted. And I don't know how they managed to do it, but they managed to get the three children back um, from basically the Bangladesh border. So they were being taken from Calcutta from our feeding program into Bangladesh. Um, And they got word out fast enough that the police were able to look out for them at the Bangladesh border. So that was a miracle to get those three children back. Um, anyway, I, I've given you four stories. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I said it was going to be hard, and, and it is. Honestly, I can see that. But I mean, I just... had to sneak that last one <laughs> in. I did. had to sneak that last one in. <laughs> Honestly, Sue, there are just so many stories of hope, and I'm sure that you can do so many more. But I, I wondered if we could talk about these kiddies. How do you help them find love again? Because obviously, there's been a lot of trauma in their lives. Mm, that's right. And uh, and obviously we're no experts um, as far as we're all different, aren't we? Every situation is different and um, every culture is different and every child is unique. So we really do rely very hard on those um, good partners that we have that understand the culture, that understand the language. So obviously a child knows uh, when... Um, Children, are, they say they're like animals, aren't they? That they can pick up a good, um, pers- you know, a good character mm. and that they can respond to love. Love is a universal language, isn't it? So a child knows, uh, a, a, you know, a, a good hug, a healthy hug, a loving person. But um, we do rely very heavily on those partners because I don't live in India. I don't live in Entebbe in Uganda. I I don't live in Ukraine and um but, but our partners do, and they understand the intricacies of the culture and they understand um, what's appropriate. Um, and we've got really good partners who get mm. alongside. So if we can provide a mum and a dad, a good family um, or, or, or a good mum figure or a good father figure, and, and um, you know, I suppose if someone's been traumatised for a number of years, it's going to take some years to, to work that through. So... There's no um, one solution or um, there's no one magic pill, so to speak. Um, It's a lot of love over a Mm. lot of time and good people, Mm. um, good people bringing that long-term healing. 
Look, I loved what you've said through this discussion, uh, particularly the stories of how Orphans Aid has grown, grown over this time and, and the miracles that you've seen. Mm -hmm. I bet a number of people will be watching today and moved by what we've been talking about. If they want to support Orphans Aid, how do they do so? Oh, we would really appreciate your help, um, whether it be small or large. So um, if you could go to our website, orphansaidinternational.org, you can donate there. You can become a sponsor. We'd love some regular sponsors, especially for our new schools in India. We've just started a new school in a um, leprosy area, a leprosy school in India. And at the moment, we're not quite sure how we're going to pay um, for that every month. So some sponsorships would be amazing. Um, so yes, and, and I'm off to Ukraine as well. So we want to do some long-term work there helping those that have been um, displaced in that area. Um, our website, orphansaidinternational.org, or you can download our app. So you can look for Orphans Aid, the Orphans Aid app and make a donation that way. Or you can pop into our op shops. So you'll see um, even up here, whoops, no, wrong side. <laughs> 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 Some side. <laughs> yeah, we, we've got uh, six op shops. Um, no, seven. Four in the four in the um, north and um, three shop locations in the south where you could donate or or um, help with just doing your shopping. So yeah, but we would love, we would really welcome your support because it is an ongoing. The needs are ongoing, but a little bit really does go a long way. Orphans Aid Interna International, I'll say that again, orphansaidinternational.org.nz, have I got that right, So no, Just orphansaidinternational.org. .org, it's Aid. as easy as that. Hey, yeah, so, orphansaidinternational.org. So thank you so much for being on the show. It has just been an absolute pleasure to hear the stories, to hear about Orphans Aid, uh, where you've been, and how it is growing. It certainly is a miraculous story to tell. So thanks again for being on the show. Oh, thank you so much. We really appreciate your help and support.